This week, we celebrate the anniversary of the launch of the New Horizons space probe, which brought us the most incredible photos of Pluto in 2015 and Arrakis in 2019. And to do this, we're joined by the Missions Operations Manager of New Horizons, Alice Bowman. I say this every week, but please do come and give us a follow on social media. We're at Space and Things One on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. And it's always great to hear from you. As always, please consider hitting that share button. But right now, enjoy episode 72 of the Space and Things Podcast. Oh my God. Listening to Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 72 of our podcast. It's week two of January, and I am now fully underway at Abbey Road Studios recording my next album. Uh, so, as with all of our January episodes, I'm afraid this was pre recorded in December, and as such, we have no news and sport. But I think we have a very special interview lined up for you. We certainly do. One of our Patreons, Don Irwin, helped us to get in contact with Alice Bowman of the John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. Alice is the Mission Operations Manager of the New Horizons Space Probe, which launched on January 19, 2006, and went on to take the most incredible photos on a flyby of Pluto and also had a secondary mission to try and perform a flyby of an object in the Kuiper Belt which it achieved in January 2019 when it sent back some incredible photos of the snowman-shaped object called Araka. So let's talk to Alice and find out all about how it happened and what's next. And uh, one one little technical thing for you. Uh, at some point, she mentions AU, which is known as the Astronomical Unit. And it's a unit of length, roughly the distance from Earth to the Sun, and equal to about 150 million kilometers or 93 million miles. So when she mentions that, that's what that means. And lock on symbols. So that's the first step. We're getting data. Okay, copy that. We're in lock with telemetry with the spacecraft. So hello, Alice, and thank you so much for joining us today. So my first question is, let's just set the scene. Um, What started scientists and your team thinking about sending a spacecraft to Pluto and other very distant solar system objects? Well, our PI, Alan Stern, had this group called the Pluto Underground, which I think he started in about 1989. And there was a a core group of scientists where their mission or their purpose was to try to get a mission to Pluto. Pluto was kind of left out, uh, the grand tour. Um, The Voyagers, you know, completed the the reconnaissance out to Neptune, but Pluto was kind of left out. And so it was their mission to try to try to get a um, mission funded by NASA to go to Pluto. And w- was it difficult to convince NASA and, and JPL to carry out that type of mission? Quite a lot of interplanetary missions get cancelled. Why do you feel that this one in particular managed to cross that hurdle? Uh, yeah, gosh, you know, there's been a number of Pluto missions on the books before New Horizons, um, at least five of them that I can remember. You know, New Horizons came along um, probably at the right time, right place. You know, we always say that that is part of the equation to being successful in in anything. With New Horizons, um, it was a competed mission. And so we did have to compete against JPL and anybody else that put in a proposal. And I think for New Horizons, what really, I guess, got NASA behind the mission and funded it was that this mission purpose was solely to go to Pluto, do a first reconnaissance. We didn't have a lot of that, or we still don't have a lot of bells and whistles on the spacecraft. It's built solely for reconnaissance of Pluto and its moons. It's very lightweight. We could get there quickly or as quickly as you can traversing, you know, 32 AU or 3 billion miles of space. (laughs) Um, 
And we didn't have a lot of new technology. When I say that, um, not that new technology is bad, it's wonderful. But when you are building a spacecraft, the more new things it has, the more open you are to having some kind of unexpected schedule delay because these are new things. And so um, we didn't have a lot of that. So it was, you know, a good balance of cost and technology and, you know, just kind of keeping it simple. All right. So we're going to fast forward through a lot of time. Obviously, New Horizons uh, was uh, selected to fly and was launched. Uh, so we're going to fast forward to the Pluto encounter in 2015. So what were your personal thoughts when, you know, you you guys got to see Pluto, not as just a, a speck through a telescope, but as an actual destination for the first time in human history? Oh, my gosh. You know, I, I will call Pluto a planet. <laughs> that, that's how I learned it. And that's how it always is in my heart. And my goodness, when you see those images of Pluto, mm -hmm. it, it does look like a planet. It's, I mean, so many comparisons that you can draw to Earth. So that first view um, was just simply amazing. Um, as a schoolgirl, I learned, you know, Pluto was a gray, mysterious rock. And that's about all we knew in the 60s <laughs> about Pluto. <laughs> and to see those pictures come across the first view that I remember seeing was actually of the what we were calling the back side, so the side that was opposite the heart. And that picture was, you know, kind of blurry and kind of grainy, but it had these magnificent swirls across the equa equatorial part of Pluto. And I just thought, oh, my gosh, can you imagine what this would look like if we were closer? And then that next picture was the picture of the, the heart. And, you know, I was just totally blown away. And, of course, you know, those images, more spectacular images just kept coming in. So it was, it, it is simply an amazing place. When, when all those images were coming in, did you feel any weight of history on your shoulders at all as part or did the team knowing that this had never been seen before and you would you would achieve this as your team? I have to admit that, that was not my first thought. Being on the engineering side, um, you know, you've probably heard that story about the July 4th anomaly that we had or abnormal condition on the spacecraft that we had. And so when those pictures started coming back um, from closest approach. I just felt this huge, huge sense of relief. We did it. We recovered that spacecraft in time to take these once in a lifetime images of Pluto. So that was my first thought <laughs> that we did it. And moving on from there, in 2019, New Horizons then flew by Arakoff, uh, the, the Kuiper Belt object. What kind of things do you feel that w were learned about objects like this from this one particular flyby? Oh, wow. That's a good question because um, this is the first spacecraft that has accomplished a close flyby of an object that's, you know, four billion miles from, from Earth. Um, I hope there are many more spacecraft that come along and are able to do that. Um, for me, I was, I was expecting an object that looked more like a single object. And this one was what they call a contact binary. And so that pretty much surprised me. And, you know, it sort of leads me to wonder if this is an oddball object or if it's something that's more the norm in the Kuiper belt. Uh, I'm not sure. And I think the other amazing thing there was that we flew by so close to it. I know you're going to say, well, 2,200 miles is not close. But it really is with an object that's 4 billion miles from Earth and with a telescope aperture, I guess, of a, a little more than 8 inches in diameter. With that kind of telescopic lens and being that close to an object, you could easily miss it if you're not spot on in your navigation. You could be close to it, but it could just go just below or just above that lens. And so... That, I think, for me, was the most amazing feat that we were able to pull off for this encounter. 
I know there was always like a, a secondary mission to try and see something in the Kuiper Belt. At what point was was Arakov chosen? Was it when it was en route? When it was it when it was past Pluto, or had the sums already been done well in advance of that? We we had hoped that we would be um, have chosen something well in advance, <laughs> but um, <laughs> it didn't pan out that way. The Hubble Space Telescope played a huge role in um, helping us to find um, an object that was within the grasp of our propellant, a range of our, our cone of propellant where we could get to. And it wasn't until um, 2014, so just um, you know, shy of a year before the Pluto close-up, was MU69 or Aerocost or Ultima Thule discovered and chosen for our next flyby. While it was what we consider close to the spacecraft, we had to do a targeting maneuver about four months after we flew by Pluto. And um, that was a bit scary because it was the largest um, maneuver that we had ever done with the spacecraft. And we had, I would say, probably 90% of the data on board from Pluto. So it was, you know, took a lot of guts yeah. and a lot of faith in our spacecraft and our engineering team to actually do that. I can't imagine what kind of stresses you guys went to to make that happen. So uh, another follow-up. Sorry, Emily, I just this is fascinating. No, this is fascinating. So, so when you then got there in 2019, what was the sense of relief or accomplishment more or less than when you got to Pluto, or was it around the same? Well, uh, you know, it's hard to compare between the two. I would say it was it was on par with Pluto. Um, we had different issues with, at Pluto. We had the, you know, we had an object that we'd known about for about 85 years. We pretty much knew where it was, but we had that unexpected um, abnormal condition that occurred, you know, just four days before that encounter sequence was going to start. With Erkos, here we are, we're presented with um, this very, very small object about 20 miles in the long direction and, you know, maybe nine or so in the narrow direction. We're much farther from Earth, which means our light de delay is much longer. So it's taking us longer to get commands to the spacecraft, get images back from the spacecraft. We have to use optical navigation to navigate to this very small object. So we needed to get those images back in order to make sure or to correct our uh, path to that object. And um, flying so close to it, you know, that was a, another challenge. So it was a huge sense of relief when we saw that object, Erikoff, float right across <laughs> the center of that telescope. It was pretty amazing. That's incredible. And that brings me to my next question. Obviously, the New Horizons spacecraft has explored some of the most distant objects that we can think of in the solar system. And that's not something that's easy to do by any stretch of the imagination. So what kind of challenges, you know, did this this really pose to your team? And um, how does that attest to the power of, of teamwork? Oh, my gosh. Teamwork is hugely important. Um, you know, we could not have done this without everybody on the team doing their part and then more, you know, to maintain the level of expertise and knowledge and just focus for those many years, you know, nine and a half from launch to where we get to closest approach with Pluto, and then another two and a half years or so until we get to Erikos. It's pretty amazing. You know, you work with people all these many years and, you know, you're like family. I know you've, you've probably heard this before, but we all care about each other. We all support one another. We all know that we don't have all the answers to every single question. Um, we rely upon each other and we don't have a problem with that. We don't have those egos that would keep us from doing that. And I think that is a huge part of the success of this mission. Yeah, absolutely. I, I remember when uh, at the 2019 flyby, and watching the footage from inside your control room and see you could tell 
that there was a bond between you all. You could like even from the outside, we watching in, we we didn't know who any of you were, but you could just tell that you guys were close and you'd gone through this together, both from your reactions at the achievement, but also how you reacted to each other. It was coming across even on a live stream. I thought it was amazing. Wow. We, we've had some questions from a couple of our Patreon subscribers. Um, Charles Boyer has asked, what, if any... Interstellar science is planned for New Horizons once it passes the heliopause. And does New Horizons have any other targets? Okay. Um, so the heliopause, let's see. I don't know if we're going to be able to get there and still have enough power to transmit data back. The heliopause is what about... 100 AU or something. I can't quite remember. We're hoping to get it to about 100 AU, but you know, it might be only 80. Um, right. I say only, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> unlike the Voyagers that I think they ha each had three um, nuclear power sources on them, New Horizons as part of that keeps the weight of the spacecraft low so that you can use most of that velocity from the rocket to get to Pluto as quick as possible. Um, we only have one our, uh, nuclear power source, so we don't have as much power. Right now we're at about 180 watts of power, and it decays about, I think, about three watts per year, something like that. And um, when we get down to 150 watts of power, uh, if we don't do anything different. And I can tell you that we're all looking to figure out what we can do differently to um, have that power margin be a little bit lower. But when we get to around 150 watts of power, we won't have enough power really to operate that spacecraft and return uh, science to Earth. Let's see, your second question. Does it have any other targets? The theory is that the Kuiper Belt goes from just beyond Neptune out to about 50 AU. The spacecraft right now is at about 52 AU, so we're just a little bit beyond there. Even so, our scientists are continuing to look for objects. So we have an observing campaign um, that we use the Subaru telescope um, in Hawaii. And then once um, some targets are found from there. We um, pick out the most promising ones and we ask for time on the Hubble Space Telescope and we uh, look to see if um, those objects meet the criteria for our spacecraft. We do have enough hydrazine on board the spacecraft to um, actually do another flyby should we find one that is on the order of an error cost, how much we had to divert to capture error cost. But right now, we have not found anything. Oh. I think the chances are probably small, but we haven't given up. The search continues. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And we have a great question from another one of our Patreons, uh, Don Irwin, who asks, we know there are instruments on the recently launched Lucy spacecraft that first flew on New Horizons. Is there a formal process of sharing experiences or is it a more informal ongoing dialogue between individuals and teams? Mm, that's a good question. So I can, I can say that generally what happens is the PI or principal investigator for that particular instrument has a tie-in to the next mission that they have proposed and actually successfully um, got that instrument incorporated on. So, for example, on the Lucy mission, there's a, an instrument called LORI. It is the next generation of the instrument called LORI on New Horizons. And the instrument PI is the same person. So there's a direct um, transfer of information there. Um, same thing with the ALICE instrument. There's one on New Horizons, and then there is one on Lucy, and I believe also the Ralph instrument. Now, these instruments may have been actually built by different organizations, but the specs are basically the same except for where uh, things can be improved. So, yes, there is formal and informal information that goes across between missions that have uh, the same or similar instrument. I find that side of it fascinating. It's so obvious, isn't it, that things get shared, but you just don't think about it. Something that's just coming to my mind, every time we talk about 
any kind of deep space probe and indeed some Earth-based satellites. Uh, and we've, we've mentioned it in particular when, when launches fail or when the launch is coming up and how nervous we are about it because we say the people involved in this mission, it may be a lifetime's work. Do you consider New Horizons to be your, your lifetime work? Can you see yourself moving on to other projects now? Or are you just so attached to this, that's it, you've done your bit and, and, and that's it? What, what's next for you? But how much of your life has gone into this one mission? I pretty much live, breathe, and um, eat Pluto um, and the mission, you know. <laughs> it's pretty much <laughs> what I do. That being said, I did have a life before New Horizons. <laughs> And I do have a life that uh, does involve other things besides New Horizons. I'm actually the group supervisor of um, the group that operates all the mission, all the space missions that APL has. So that includes the most recently launched DART spacecraft, which is that double asteroid redirection test, and Dragonfly, which is coming up in a couple years, a mission to explore Titan using a quadcopter on the surface. Um, so I do do other things, but I think while I do get a lot of satisfaction out of working on New Horizons and continuing to work on it, I feel that one of my uh, you know, focuses now is to, is to mentor those people that are coming up, um, the next generation of uh, space operators, because I have I feel like I have a knowledge, lot of knowledge to pass on, and I, I feel that, that that's our duty to um, ensure that these types of missions go on for generations to come. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us today, and it's been a real honor. <laughs> I've always wanted to talk to you, so it's been a real big honor to interview you today. Oh, well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alice. Thank you. Uh, CNG supports normal status. Our SSR pointers are where we expect them to be, which means we have recorded the expected amount of data. Copy that. Looks like we have a good data record. That was really exciting. I've always wanted to talk to Alice Bowman, uh, probably for a decade yeah. or so at least <laughs> ever since I found out of about uh, what New Horizons was going to do. So this is so exciting. She was very cool and she answered a lot of my questions because if I was on a team that sent a spaceship, a spacecraft to the most distant places in the solar system, I'm like, I, I don't know if I'd be able to do anything else. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, I'd be I'd be like, yeah, that's it. I'm, I'm, I've got nothing else. But she's I love how she's very motivated to, you know, she's working on other projects, including DART, which is awesome. And I love how she's sort of mentoring, you know, the younger generation that's going to go into uh, planetary science, which is, I wish I'd gone into something like that because it's so cool. I, I don't have the background and I'm a little old to go to school for that, but that is just so fascinating to me. I love it. Yeah, I was super excited that we got to interview Alice there. Uh I love watching the broadcasts from within their mission control when the key po moments are happening on their missions. And of course, her job title is Missions Operations Manager, which is Mom. Yeah. And it says it on her desk. She's got a name tag that says Mom. And everyone refers to her as mom. It's one of those little things that just makes you smile. Uh, and so to me, she's a bit of a celebrity. So to actually get to talk to her there, I was kind of like, oh my God, oh my God. Yeah, me too. Because that team and, and what they achieved is incredible. I mean, the, the photos, I think the photos that we've had from New Horizons are possibly some of the best things that have come out of space exploration in the last decade. Oh, yeah. I agree totally. Like when those images of Pluto first started coming through, I could not believe what I was seeing. And even now, there's a Twitter account called uh, Bits of Pluto that posts tiny images of from these images that that, that were, were sent. And they're all they always make me smile. They always make me smile. And then when they went out to Arakoff and it, the little snowman thing that appeared over Christmas, like or just after Christmas, it just all felt so perfect. But again, seeing those images. Is this this tiny thing and seeing it come to life first you had the the blurred image and then it started re re focusing and as it got closer the, the 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 resolution got better and better and then suddenly this object is there that we didn't even know about or didn't know what it looked like we just knew there was an object and it's there i mean 
it's ridiculous. It's so ridiculous what they've achieved uh, with this spacecraft. And it will always have a special place in my heart. I don't know about you. Oh, absolutely. Same here. Uh, I remember the morning the the first uh, photo started to roll in from New Horizons. And I was just, uh, I remember digging up a, a picture that Hubble had taken of Pluto like in the 90s. And, you know, it was very pixelated. Not that Hubble is awesome, but, you know, it, it has a limit. And I, I remember looking at that picture and comparing it to New Horizons, and I was like, wow, we actually know Pluto is like a place now. Like, yeah, I think sometimes, you know, when we learn about the solar system, at least when I did in school, and this isn't really a diss to my teachers, it's just, I think it was more how I interpreted it. It's like, you don't really conceptualize that planets, other planets are real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you don't see them like all the time and then you get a telescope or you get a- get access to a-, a decent telescope and you're like, holy crap, this is an actual place, you know, and with Pluto, it was so distant. None of us had ever really seen it until then. And it was like, yeah. oh, my God, it's a place, you know, and um, I totally agree. I-, I think it's definitely up there with I- I'm going to I'll probably upset people by saying this, but I really don't care, though. I think it's up there with the moon landings. I really do. I don't think you're wrong at all, actually, in, in that as well. That when you look at the challenges to get there, to get as close, when you look at the speeds that it was travelling as it took those photos, and I know that other probes are, are travelling similar speeds when this happens, but you're going all that way, 4 billion miles or whatever it is to get there, and then you're whizzing by it super fast, and in that time frame, you're able to take photos that clear, that amazing, and send them back on this tiny spacecraft which had to be light enough to get there and because they were trying to get there quick, as quick as it could. The challenges involved in that are ridiculous. I mean, I've tried throwing a paper aeroplane <laughs> across my road, and I can't do it. Right? Yeah. And then they're sending something with that precision, that far, and getting shots that quick. You try taking a photo whilst moving, whilst walking, and getting it in shot, and then try doing it at a ridiculous speed, faster than we can even imagine how fast that thing's going. Yeah. It's just all those kind of things just blow my mind about missions like this. And in last week's episode, we spoke about Voyager and. This is a great continuation of that. And who knows what's coming next? Yes, we know there's missions to Venus planned and other planets and Titan. Yeah. But every time these missions get planned and they actually go, they actually happen, you've got to be excited about it because the technology is just getting better and better and better. Yeah. So in 10 years' time, when, when these places are visited again, if they get visited again, think about what what we're going to see then it's it's just going to blow our minds and it just brings it all to life for us absolutely yeah I, I keep thinking about the difference between like the pioneer images and the voyager images i mean that was less than 10 years and, exactly and granted pioneer was done by ames and not jpl so it's a it's a little different from voyager but um you you look at the pioneer images and they're not bad but they're kind of lower resolution you know and you look at Pi- voyager and it's like what the heck i mean those are still incredibly good images considering that the spacecraft was launched in the late seventies. You know, I mean, yeah. Voyager is, is, is older than oh God is older than me, you know, and I'm getting up there. So I always think about, you know, when we, for example, like you said, when we see the spacecraft that are due to go to Venus, I have no doubt we're going to find out things we, we had no idea about previously. Oh, I can't wait. And it's going to be amazing. And it's it, it's going to be just incredible. It's going to be that same high we got during New Horizons where, you know, we were seeing a place for the first time. Yeah. You know what? That interview was so good. I put talking to Alice Bowman up there, we're talking to Fred Hayes, you know, someone who's in the middle and the thick of these exciting things, which means so much to us. I mean, Yes, we just got to talk to the missions operations manager of, of New Horizons. I mean that you, that's just incredible to me. Same here. I was very humbled talking to her. I was like, oh my god, I, I really admire that. I've always wanted to talk to her, so I was very humbled <laughs> the whole time. I was like, oh my god, I'm, I'm talking to a legend. This is this is really cool. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, one point of order, really. Uh, Alice brought up the July Fourth anomaly a few times, and some people may not know what that was. Now, just a little 
background on this. This is about 10 days before it reached Pluto and the spacecraft went into safe mode and they couldn't communicate with it. When you factor that in to then 10 days later getting those images, it's even more incredible, isn't it? Yeah. I kind of remember, I think I remember when that happened and I was like, oh, sh you know, because I was like, man, shoot. Yeah, shoot. <laughs> shucks. Yeah, shucks. Because um, I was like, man, they came all this way and this happens, you know, and uh, geez. But you know what? They they turned it around and they and they got results. And that's that also is incredible as well. Like, I think if you made a movie about, you know, a lot of these interplanetary missions like New Horizons, people wouldn't believe it. There's so much um, drama. I mean, it, it really is exciting and it really kept them on their toes, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and the fact of this in as well, it's a nine hour round trip at that point to send a command and receive anything back. It's four and a half hours there, four and a half hours back. So you know it's in safe mode. Well, you know it was in safe mode four and a half hours ago. The command that you've sent to try and recover it takes four and a half hours to get there and then another four and a half hours back. I mean, that's just nuts, isn't it? Yeah. They, they must have been pulling their hair out going, oh my God, because anything that might seem to be a simple fix, you still got to wait so long before you know if it's worked. Uh, and, and I know just from doing recording with people in other countries where someone says, oh, can you just turn the bass down? Yeah, hang on a moment. So I now have to go into the file, do that, render it down, send it to you via the internet, wait for you to listen to it. Then you call me up and say, like, that's a nightmare enough. And that's on planet Earth where actually it only takes about another 15 minutes. And it's annoying enough, yeah. let alone nine hours i can't imagine yeah that that must have been a uh, very emotionally challenging <laughs> i know yeah. i would have been pulling my hair out so yeah i remember when the first pictures of pluto were were, were coming out from new horizons and because it, it the signal had to travel such a long way and there's so much data that has to come back and forth they were getting like a trickle of data because of the distance yeah so pictures are being released very slowly and people were getting like why aren't they releasing more pictures did they and i'm like Guys, Pluto isn't like on 4th Street. Yeah. I live right next to 4th Street in um St. Petersburg, Florida. Like uh Pluto isn't on 4th Street. You can't just drive there. It's very far away. You're not just going to get pictures back like, "Okay, we're done." <laughs> you know? I I feel like as a society, we're very instant gratification obsessed and it's like y the good things are worth waiting for and I think as we see m other uh deep space missions, you know, we're going to have to wait as well, but I think it'll be very much worth it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. PI, Mom on Pluto One. We have a healthy spacecraft. We've recorded data of the Pluto system and we're outbound for Pluto. So that's it for this week. We hope you enjoyed hearing a little bit more about New Horizons. I know I did. Uh, so thanks again to all who continue to support us by signing up to our Patreon page or buying merchandise or donating on our website. It really does mean so much to us. And more thanks to those who press the share button or leave a review. Those things massively help us out too. But don't forget, in space, no one can hear you me. Space and Things has been brought to you by... And Things Productions.